Welcome, everyone. I think we'll wait a minute or two to make sure that uh, everybody gets a chance to log in, and then we'll start this fun, entertaining, exciting, and adventurous webinar. That's a lot to live up to right there. <laughs> no, no pressure, Lee. None whatsoever. <laughs> And if we can check it, it, and you let me know if all the people are in at this moment. Is the participant total at the bottom of your screen? Is that... Oh, okay. It's sad when old people use technology, isn't it? It, it really is. <laughs> that walking and chewing gum thing gets tougher every year. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, I see some participants in here. And it is uh, five o'clock West Coast. So I think we should probably begin here. And as soon as I get my script pulled up, we can rock and roll. So welcome to this special Think Like a Cartoonist webinar hosted and sponsored by Rochester Institute of Technology. Our theme tonight is the world of creativity and imagination, taking our cues from a new book, Think Like a Cartoonist, by longtime professional cartoonist Lee Rubin, whose single panel cartoon Rubes appears in hundreds of newspapers, <clears throat> excuse me, and media outlets worldwide. But he did not write this book alone. He did so in collaboration with a number of his friends who each submitted an account of a time in which they used their creativity and out-of-the-box thinking to solve a problem in an inventive or unusual way. The program tonight is expected to last approximately an hour, and we will be sharing insights from the book and telling stories. Those of you who are watching can post questions in the chat feature, and we'll work them in as time allows. But before we meet our panelists today, we want to find out more about our author and artist, Lee Rubin, with his more than 20 books to his credit. And in addition to newspaper cartoons, his work has been featured in films, television, and advertising including a 50-foot rendition of one of his cartoons on the side of a building and was even done legally and with permission. Yeah. So with, with that, we introduce Lee. Welcome. Hi, Roger. Hi, everyone. Yes. Now, I want to take you back, back, back in the mists of time to the beginning of when you started your creativity process. And I think a lot of it had to do with working in your father's print shop. Am I correct? Yes, it was nothing but a creative place to work. It was a family uh, family print shop that he opened up in the early 70s. And that was my job since, oh, I don't know. I was there for about 21 years. Mm -hmm. uh, the last 10 of those years was working the regular job and drawing the cartoon. So it was a, and that included a commute and a car without air conditioning and let me let me just tell you about my struggle. Yeah, but, yes. Yeah, and I'd like and it, it actually ended it was an act of god uh the uh, 1994 uh, Northridge earthquake that uh, ended my career at my dad's print shop because there was no more freeway to get there. So oh. I skipped a whole lot of stuff there but you got the little bit of, little bit of each, you know. Okay. And I understand that, that it was a greeting card that started you on this career. Uh, right. Early, uh, I, I was an advertising arts major, and I was walking through a pharmacy in the late 70s, and I saw this row of greeting cards uh, by Sandra Boynton. There were, uh, she's very, very popular still, very yeah. fun, fun and funny cartoonist author, and her cards were just terrific. And I thought, you know, that's how I can, I'll start my own greeting card company. And so I started, a, you know, Drew one, tested it out on the counter, sold it for 50 cents, uh, was, uh, all I need is that little bit of encouragement, really, and and look, that's all, that got me started. And you you ended up uh, doing a bunch of those and then yeah. collected them in a book, as I recall. Uh, not those, I what I did was, I went from the greeting cards to authoring a book on, with musical notes, yeah. and the musical notes became a book which led to me doing a book signing at a, a, a store in Lancaster, California. Do you remember Walden Books? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and there I met with the uh, editor or the entertainment editor of the Antelope Valley Press in uh, Palmdale, California. 
uh, and we became friends. We'd go out now and then and have beer. And that, you know what happens when you're doing that? You come up with ideas. And he said, how'd you like to draw a daily cartoon for our newspaper? And I said, it's exactly what I want to do. And then it took six months to convince the publisher that this was a good idea because, you know, you got to spend money. And mm -hmm. so they paid me a whopping $10 per cartoon. Um, yeah. It, you know, went a lot further in those days. Yeah. And and that that was the humble beginnings of, of Rubes. And that was November 1st, 1984. So right now I'm into the 40th year. Wow. It hasn't hit 40. It'll be next November 1st. You're going to keep doing this till you get it right, is my understanding. Yeah, yeah if that ever happens. Practice, yeah. practice, practice, practice. Yeah. All righty. Uh, and just for fun, let's see if we can make this work here. Um, I want to, those people who are on who have not seen the Rubes cartoon, I just wanted to share one of them. We, will, we have a few that will be interspersing throughout the evening here. And if I can do my right share a screen thing. And this is, this is one that, okay. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. How did that happen? <laughs> That's almost as funny as the first one I ever drew. That's right. Okay. Well, I had the, here it is. <coughs> I'll, I'll let it supply. There there you, can that be seen okay? We see it now. Okay. And I think one of the things that is interesting about this is, again, <laughs> Lee has a wonderful way of playing with words. And uh, he... Uh, the element of surprise taking two different aspects of the same word and uh, making the connection in a, a humorous way. So I think that's uh, one of the examples of it. Okay. I, I, I appreciate your patience with me because there we go. This is new technology for, for me on this side. You got to put your face up there there you are there we go okay. yeah, yeah. That, all right way, that said professor rittenberg that rick was the guinea pig i don't know if he's watching or not now but rick is one of my oldest friends and he wrote the guinea pig story for the book oh yes so he, he was my test my test and it worked out so well it's you can blame him too <laughs> he, he has some responsibility here yeah and i think i'm just going to throw one more up here because I think if I remember correctly, that as I scroll through the, that this is the image and gets to it, share again. And that's, this is probably my favorite cartoon in the whole book. Oh, that's the one with Jeff's story. Yes. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Right. I just, I just love that when you, you talk about uh, uh, bikes and stuff. It's really fascinating stuff. Okay, so let's stop me sharing and get back to it. Um, somebody uh, put a question in. He says, this past weekend, I bought a copy of Penguin and Penguin Gwen number one. I'm going to do it to the Library of Congress. Can you talk about working in comic books and why you did this? Uh, I, I'm surprised you could find a copy of that. Very rare. Yeah. Book. There is one on my bookshelf back there. Uh -huh. um, I did one comic book with Phil uh, yay, the co-author of that of uh, that book, uh, Penguin and Pencilgin, for those of you who do not know, where it was a a a a penguin and a pencilgin with their noses reflecting a pen and a pencil, and they promoted literacy. It was a, a series of comic books that uh, that uh, Phil drew, and I co-wrote with him, and even a short-lived comic strip, very short-lived comic strip, but it. it the uh, the first book itself was hatched on a harebrained uh, I shouldn't say harebrained it was a, it was a six week thirty six state tour using cartoons to promote literacy that we went on in a van across the United States. Um, so crazy things can happen when you get six cartoonists in a van. For oh that my goodness! Book. Yeah, and, are there, and I suspect the statute of limitations covers that by now. So you're probably okay. <laughs> we were we were we were pretty good. All right. All right, and and Mike Rody says thanks. Obviously, the Library of Congress doesn't have a copy; they do now, or they will. Now, wow, I mean, uh, thank you very much for that. I'm impressed. Yeah. All right, um, I think we should introduce our panelists here, and I'll get my cheat sheet that tells me how wonderful you all are, which is pretty much fun. I have enjoyed meeting a lot of you, which is just really nice. So let's see. 
if I can get this all pulled together here. And we'll start out. Uh, let's start with, since I mentioned Jeff Harmon is, says an ex-cab driver, ex-postal worker, ex-California Highway op Patrol officer, and an ex-insurance investigator who says he's now retired and living in Florida. So we're crossing the country tonight. And he, like all of those on the panel tonight, contributed to story collection. He's also a baseball umpire, professional speaker, and short story writer. Tell me about your connection with Lee and how far back it goes. Well, as you can probably know by now, I can't hold a job. That's why I finally <laughs> retired. But no, I know I know Lee from way, way back because well, way, way back, he married my sister. So mm -hmm. it's quite, and don't say nepotism. I got here on my own talent. That's right. Uh, that's, that's right. And, and your story was the story was was really excellent. Do you want to mention a little bit about what the story is about? Because I think I should tell people that the story book is full of everybody's stories, and is also Lee goes through and comments um, on the uh, the whole all the aspects of creativity and thinking out of the box. And it's a wonderful read, particularly page one hundred seven. But that's uh, that's another story. Uh, yeah. Um, tell us about your story a little bit, because it was one of the best in the book, I'll have to say. Well, was, there was two of them, Willie Davis or the Highway Patrol. Which one are you talking about? The Highway Patrol. OK. So, yes, I was a member of the California Highway Patrol for a lot of years, way back when. And usually you're on patrol by yourself. But you got to stop anybody and everybody that violates traffic laws. And one, one day I was pull, I pulled over a guy in a Harley belonging to a notorious motorcycle gang, mm -hmm. making a, a illegal left turn. So <laughs> it's always a challenge meeting up these guys because you don't know what they're going to do. Sometimes they get their street cred by um, pouncing on a cop just for fun. Mm -hmm. So during, I was running it up the ticket, keeping my distance from him. And he started, he leans against my car doing like this. And I'm thinking, I hate it when people do that. I mean, that's so disrespectful. I'm sitting on my car. So <laughs> I could have gotten really tough with them and got my 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 PR24 stick and and threatened to do something to him unless he complied with get off my car. I could have done all of that. But you know, at the end of the day, we just want to go home to our from our jobs, right? So I just said, just for like, a, I just just to try something different. I said, "Could you please get off my car, please?" <laughs> and he was not expecting that. <laughs> and he got off the car, and I mean, he was so shocked <laughs> that he just he just got off the car and and took the ticket and he went on his way. Um, <laughs> a wonderful ending to a story. So that's what happened. Fill him with kindness. It's again out of the box thinking being creative, not giving them what they expect. And, yes. and it, it's a wonderful, wonderful story. And we appreciated that. But what, what do you see as the important parts of creativity in your life? Well, it's picking subjects that resonate with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, I was a baseball umpire, which I still am, but I love playing little league as a kid. So finding stories that you experienced as a kid when things are so serious and life is full of angst and and you're never happy playing ball if you're not good at it because you think you're going to fail and fail your team and strike out again. All these things that you think about, how terrible it all is. And people can relate to that because most people were the same way. Mm -hmm. Baseball, especially because everybody played baseball or softball. Not everybody played football or basketball or even ice, ice hockey. But baseball stories are a font of, of wonderful stories because everybody can relate to them. So I, I talk about baseball a lot in my speeches. Great. Great. Well, let's pass on to some of our other uh, panelists tonight. And Deb Goodrich says she was inspired by watching Lois Lane of the Superman television show uh, and became a reporter at age 15. She's worked in print, radio, and television. In between, she's earned a history degree, has appeared as a talking head in numerous documentaries, and has written and produced film projects based on the American West. I love this line. She says, generally speaking, she'd find you far more interesting if you died 100 years ago. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. 
I I live in Kansas now, but I grew up in southwestern Virginia, Mayberry RFD, eight miles <laughs> from Mount Airy, North Carolina. And my sister sums it up best. She says, I'll be on the phone. And she said, I don't know if she's talking about her neighbor or somebody that's been dead 150 years. You know, they're all the same. So, and that's what my story is about in the book. You know, it's all the same. Don't let a little death get in the way of making new friends. You know, so that's great. His so story. What, how does you come to know Lee and uh, doing doing the 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 connection there? Well, I had another personality, you know, before the meds kicked in. And I had um, met Lee at the Topeka Public Library when he was on a, a tour. And I had a character that I was doing. I wore a big red wig and um, I was Dixie Lee Jackson and I was an expert in cooking and kissing. And uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> so, so that's when I, yeah, that was just one of my many lives, but it was a lot of fun. And Lee, I've been a fan, like so many of you who are watching, I know, you know, the, the bulletin board refrigerator, this is the possum funeral, which I think may be the funniest thing I have ever seen, where one possum looks at the other possum in the coffin and says, for the last time, Benny, this time you had better not just be playing. That casket cost me a freaking fortune. Is that not hilarious? <laughs> so I was a fan before I ever met Lee. Like, you know, I'm sure many of you were. Absolutely. And I, I as a question here that, uh, and I think we're going to get some people that are going to ask about how cartooning is. And uh, Mary Feltusen says, I have a concept. I've started the characters. Is one cartoon frame better than four frames? How do you pitch these ideas in the modern world? Is there a meme world? Should I think of a book or newspaper? Where do I even start? So that's a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, I my my preference is a single panel, sometimes split in two, but it really depends if you have a recurring character, then it probably makes a lot more sense to do a strip. Um yeah, because then it's like, you know beginning middle end and you and it's a consistent character that you're going to be drawing over and over again for hopefully years uh there are a lot of questions in there right uh yeah is uh should you think of a book or newspaper where do you start uh probably now online yeah that would be the preference because honestly it's the state of newspapers is is not fantastic. <laughs> um, I still love them. I still love the fact that people could clip stuff out, uh, but I would probably, you know, maybe start online with it and then develop a following or, you know, all those social media, like Instagram or whatever, TikTok, and develop a following there where you can get a base of people that would buy your book, unless you're in incredibly independently wealthy and want to give it away, which no cartoonist does that when they start out. Um, but also, you know, you, if you, we can communicate more, you know, my email will be clearly available somewhere here, right? If not, we can get it. I, but, I also I didn't want to jump in and mention it. Somebody asked, will this be recorded? Yes, they will be recorded. And uh, I think everybody that's going to be participating or signed on tonight will get a chance to um, get a, a, a that link so they can pass it, pass it on. And uh, Mike Rohde says a lot of gag and panel cartoonists are using Instagram now. So there may be a, a source for you. Um, let me go on and introduce Robin Blakely, who got her creative start as she writes as that funny little kid who believed that the thoughts zooming through her head deserved to come to life as words, drawings, and on game boards so that others could play. She still believes that fun is powerful and that talent means business. Now a top brand building coach and the founder of Creative Center of America, she helps people make professional dreams happen faster. Welcome. Thank you. Um, you know, I've gotten an opportunity to know Lee for a very long time. And I lived in the Antelope Valley um, when he was launching his panel, but I didn't know that he lived in the area. I, I thought it was a national cartoon that was already had already made it big. 
and I was a huge fan. And uh, I was a producer of a radio talk show there in the same community and invited Lee to come and be on the show there because I heard he was nearby. And so I was very excited to meet him. And um, and one of the first things that I have still is this wonderful, uh, fun, one of the greeting cards that you were talking about from back in the 80s and um, loads and loads of fun. Um, this one says, this just in ferocious escape lion devours anchorman, details at 11. And of course, <laughs> the lion is taking over the anchorman's job. <laughs> so I, I had would, was writing news at the time, uh, you know, too. So I love that. And it's been on my wall all of these years. So yeah. loads yeah. of fun. Uh, and thank you for that. Tell us about your story. Um, my story is uh, about a moment when I was... Um, trying to figure out how to handle some of my clients. I'm a coach and uh, do a lot of creative strategy. And so one, one time I was trying to figure out how to really move forward fast with them. And I noticed these little characters that were on my, um, on my windowsill and they're little glass uh, figurines. And I realized that we could make them uh, stand in for the different roles that um, a client would be facing. So it would be PR and marketing and sales and their creative hat and their um, bookkeeping and their traffic or time management hat. So each one of them had uh, an opportunity and I named them, renamed them all. They were, they were four spices. So instead of salt, it became PR and so on. And um, when I would uh, interview and talk to clients, I would ask them for each one of these characters, what you know, how is it going with your PR? How's it going with marketing? Did you do your taxes? You know, this kind of stuff and, you know, get all of my little reports together. And I thought it was really, um, it really helped and it really moved the clients forward. And I didn't want to tell them about it because I thought they're going to think this is crazy. But I ended up with a lot of clients and I finally said, hey, this is the game we're playing. Can you just play it with me? And when they did, everybody moved faster, faster, faster. There was huge growth. So that's been a signature process in our in, in this company since then. And um, it was really, you know, just a moment of a flash where it came to came to me. Obviously, you kept in touch with Lee over the years as well. So I sure have I've been following him for a long time and watching all of the things that, you know, one thing about his talent was the when he it first hit the paper, it looked national. I mean, it just was fun. He was so funny and so clear. Yeah. So, yeah, he is. And and again, there's a certain amount of skull sweat, you might call it, if you don't have a recurring character and you have to come up with a brand new every time. So we'll give him. Play. And we have a question from the audience says, did Lee draw as a child? Did he draw cartoons always? Is that true? That wasn't my brother that asked that, was he? It says anonymous attendee, oh, okay. not his brother. So. OK, OK. Uh, no. Yeah. My first my very first cartoon really I'll, I'll, I'll back it up so kindergarten that it's my earliest memory of that and in kindergarten in the early 60s uh we had nap time and drawing time and among other times and and there were those were my two favorite activities which and like i've said many times before if you ask Teresa. She would say, I do that I do that every day still. So I, I like to stay consistent. Uh, so yeah, and I drew, I, so I drew this picture of a giant. This is the very first cartoon, a giant that was so big, I had to put his head on the other side of the piece of paper. And my teacher uh, thought that was very funny and my parents thought it was funny. And again, all I needed was that little bit of encouragement. Uh, it was unintentional. I was, what I was really doing was problem, problem solving. I had ran out of space on that paper. So yeah. And ever, I mean, ever since then, I had loved to draw and, and it was early influence. If you can see that big piece of art behind me, yeah. uh, that was my, um, my uncle, uh, Brian, uh, was my cartoon pen pal. He lived in oh. New York at the time and we would write back and forth and he would draw these great little cartoons i have all those letters still from the early or mid 60s they were terrific uh so he was really fun to bounce ideas back and forth with so you you uh, tell, let me uh, ask you about your first reader your in-house editor and uh uh 
support system. I think once you said to me that you showed it to Teresa and she said that's sick, you said that's a winner. Is that true? Yeah, if she if yeah, if it's a polite laugh, then it's not gonna really fly. But if she goes, Oh, that's sick, then it's I know it's there a you winner. go. Ab absolutely. Um, let's talk a little bit about the creative aspects uh, of it. Um, what about dealing with deadlines? I mean, you're doing one every single day, seven days a week, 365. Yeah, you want to depress me, don't you? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no, it's just, it's when you be careful what you wish for, but really it's it's a it's kind of almost that I thrive on that. Even if I complain about it, um, it's you, that pressure forces you to be creative, whether you want to be creative or not. There's no excuses. Newspaper editors are not real fond of like blank spaces in the paper, you know, it'd be like dead radio time. You're yeah. not, you're not going to impress anybody like that. So you have to put out something, but you know, put out something consistent and consistently good is, you know, like you, you have to add a little more uh, definition onto each of that. But yeah, I, I just don't allow anything like writer's block to get in the way, even if it feels like it might be moving in, you just stick with it until you come up with something. And you have a, you have a trick for dealing with that. You go for a walk. Is that, is that something that helps? uh play with the dog throw with the ball uh answer email go have a cup of coffee or whatever take a nap but you always have to come back to it yeah you, you can't escape so, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if that time away lets the back subconscious work out something for you well that's that worked out that uh, i that's a one of the examples i use is the uh the got milk cartoon which i don't know if you have don't have i should have that it's a classic but, but there was a time back in the mid 90s where I just did not have an idea and I was very, very frustrated. And that was before email. So, or before I used email. So that's when you had to mail hard copies into the, into the newspaper or excuse me, into my syndicate for editing, yeah. which of course that added days. Now, you know, everything is done with email. Uh, and I just realized I did not have, I didn't have an idea. I was getting very frustrated. So I went to the store and I was walking up and down the aisles and I came up to this one particular aisle, the cookie aisle, and they had the little sign that said, got milk. And then it's this instant. I mean, I, I do have a picture of it. I think Jeff, you actually took this photo and I don't want to go grab it, but it's a, that's the 40 by 60 foot side of the wall in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. It became, it became uh, used by the folks that did got milk. Uh, mm -hmm. so it, if I had an idea, I wouldn't have gone to the store. I may never have come up with that idea. So you just never know. You have to just keep your mind and your eyes and ears constantly open for inspiration. Cause I, I do believe it's all around it. A lot of times you just have to create it yourself though. Okay. It just so happened. I lucked out. Oh, there it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry about all the other stuff in the background there, but <laughs> And no cows were harmed in the drawing of this cartoon. Yeah. Uh, it's a classic. And to see that thing on the side of a building, pretty impressive. See that. I I feel like I'm not letting all the other panelists talk here. So if you, you've got questions for Lee or comments you'd like to make, um, let's start. Well, I, Jeff. I do Come have back. a comment I'd like to make. And the contributors to this book, you know, Lee knows everybody, but we don't know everybody. And so since my book arrived, I've been reading through it. And I do have another friend, Roger Ashelman, who wrote about his National Guard experience. You might not think that that was that creative, but it is. It's hilarious. It's priceless. But every one of these I have read, I'm like, these are people worth knowing. I want to know these people. This would be the coolest party ever if we could get <laughs> all the contributors from this book in one room because everybody is bright and interesting and creative and in such a variety of, of vocations and situations. Um, that's amazing. This is a really worthwhile book. It, I, I'm just so proud.
proud to be part of it and so happy to meet these other people, to meet all of you. It's wonderful. And all of them are alive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, despite that, it's still a really worthy volume. Yeah. All right. That's... Roger, I can add something to that. Yeah, please. The truth of the matter is that everybody, everybody has stories. Yes. That they can tell. The only problem that prevents them from telling them is they they think they're not going to be funny or they're not going to be inspirational or they're not nobody's going to listen to them. So, but they don't. But that's wrong. Everybody can tell stories. All they can do is do it, and you'll be yeah. surprised the reaction you'll get. That what you think is dumb or stupid or nobody wants to hear it, the audience will. And they'll say, "Wow, it's a great story." Yeah. So give it a try. It's 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 everybody's got stories, and it gets easier. Yes. As you as you go and you get more you have more fun with it. Uh Robin, you've got a comment here? Yeah, I, I was thinking about, you know, um, I wanted to ask Lee how he chose cartoons to illustrate or to be a companion, not necessarily illustrate, but to be a companion to each yeah. of these stories. That had to have taken some work. Well, okay, so you want a, I can give you a little backstory. I don't want to dominate this, but so the idea. I went in. I went into RIT Press. I was introduced by the person that wrote the uh, forward for this book. Jamie Weinbrake was the uh, former dean of liberal arts at RIT. We met with uh, Bruce Austin, who was the director of RIT Press and one of the other professors that worked there. And I suggested, you know, writing a book about where, you know, about creativity. And and he suggested, well, why don't you hire a journalist to go out and uh, interview all sorts of people that can tell their story about creativity. There was absolutely no budget. I mean, there was no budget at all. So I became that journalist and, and reached out and contacted uh, roughly 150 people. Uh, I did not get to select which stories went in the book, by the way. I submitted them all and the director at the time went through and edited and did a fabulous job of picking out stories. Uh, there were some I would have loved to include and who knows, volume two, right? Um, the idea was I was gonna have a cartoon that went along with each one and I was gonna create one for that. And then I realized that's a terrible idea. So what I did was I have a, somewhere about 14,000 cartoons. I made them work with the stories. If I, if I had to change, I didn't really have to change many of them, but I typically had them that worked really well and yeah. to illustrate the story because it was already a mammoth project as it was. I was terribly impressed with how you were able to do that. I mean, they, the, the, uh, and, and, and how, how you could even with 14,000 cartoons, <laughs> how did you even find them? You know, I mean, you must have a quite a system to, to file them, to find them. Oh, you, yeah. It's amazing how disorganized I can be. <laughs> I, I know I did one with a motorcycle once, but when, what year was it? Yeah. And I used to be able to, I knew, used to be able to pick out, oh, it was, uh, it was in January of 1997. Now I just like, it, it, there's so many years, I, I'm way off a lot of times. Like the one you had, Deb, I, could not find it the other day when I was looking for it. <laughs> but thank you for the date. Oh, it's priceless. It's, yeah. it's been on it's been on my refrigerator since 2009 too. Same Even though I've moved, it's it's been there for that long. So yeah. Interesting question from uh Shacey, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Johnson, who says, I believe creativity is one of the keys to success in every profession. Amen to that. What do each of you see as the greatest threat to creativity? Good question. Insecurity. <laughs> no, I have an instant answer to that. AI. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh chat, yeah. Chat GPT. It scares the heck out of me. Yeah. So I hope. Uh, I, I I don't think that's rise a threat to creativity. <laughs> I I can't believe that'd be a threat to creativity because it it doesn't. You have to be creative to figure out even how to tell it to produce something worth worth looking at well i, I just worry about it's stifling creativity in people that they'll yeah. they'll, they'll get be tend to be dependent on it and won't even try to be creative anymore 
That's what that's what I'm afraid of. That's what especially you're kids, of. especially kids. That's, that's really interesting because to me, I think people are, uh, you know, that they are, um, they don't try to be very. They're 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 already stifled. They're already feel like you know that they, in in regular jobs, feel like they you know they aren't creative. They say that a lot. Do you hear that a lot from people around you? I mean, not around you, but in in the daily world. Yeah, and I think people are. I really do. I think insecurity is the greatest uh, um, negative in in the human um, existence. It it makes people uh, hold back, you know, from from trying or or giving voice to things, and and it makes them judge other people unfairly, you know, their own insecurity and. And, you know, Jeff, to what you were saying about, you know, open up and tell your story, you know, we've got, um, you know, I had a talk radio show, you know, we've got radio people here um, asking people their story and not judging, you know, I, I, I know this, but I continue to be floored by the story that comes out of some very average, nondescript looking person. Yeah. And when you start learning their story, you're flabbergasted. You know, they they were uh, a gentleman I met the other day um, had worked on the Rosebud Reservation as an ophthalmologist. And here he is, he's in a business suit in Philadelphia and it, it, very uptight, you know, and I'm like, the Rosebud Reservation, and he was so animated talking about that. And his friends were like, I had no idea he did that. Just ask, you know, ask people what their story is and, and listen. Yes, yeah, so as somebody who's done a talk show and, and interviewed many, many people, it's fascinating. You never know. It is. And it's sometimes the least likely that you, yep. prejudge, come right. up with the most amazing stories. So. Yep. Let, let me tell you what I what I actually done with kids. I'm actually working as a tutor now for people that have trouble reading, kids reading comprehension, that sort of thing. And one typical student of mine, we're reading a book called The Dog Named Goldie for five, you know, four year old, seven year old kids reading the book. So he'll read a page, and I ask him, "Well, what's what? Tell me what's going on in the story." And he'll tell me, so I understand. I know that he's understanding what he's reading. And then I'll say something like, "Well." Tell me what happens next. Just make up something that happens next. And then I actually actually ask him to show me with little objects on the table. Like, here's a dog, Goldie. Here's the here's the parent. Here's the dad in this little object. And just show me what's going to happen next. And they just take off. They take off ex, ex, uh, inventing stuff. That's funny. And actually That's has wonderful. a purpose. And it's it's wonderful to see. If you just, and then I and then the key is I validate them. I acknowledge what they did. That was great because it was great and they yeah. love it. It's really a great you, uh, little tool I have or use. Yeah. You gave them non-threatening permission to, mm -hmm. to explore their creativity and then you rewarded them for it. And that's going to work every time, I think. Yep, you're right. You're right. Um, when you, is there a trick any of you use to generate creativity? Do you meditate? Do you, Go for a long walk. Is are there things that you do to stimulate that aspect of your life? Besides I, getting my against the desk. <laughs> oh, good, Deb, go ahead. Sorry, I, rest. I um I read poetry, and uh, you know because most of the work that I do right now is nonfiction as a historian and researcher. Um, so I read poetry, and I I love reading nursery rhymes. I found a wonderful old book of nursery rhymes the other day, and there's one that I had never heard. They hunted and they hunted and nothing did they find, but this groundhog or something, and this they left behind. And I'm like, oh my God, that has just stuck in my head. And I'm like, this is so cool. And it's a very long nursery rhyme, but it just makes you think in another lane. You know, it just puts you in another lane. Do you ever any any of you ever take languages and start getting to the point where you think in other languages and see if that affects you at all? I, 
Apparently not. I like to mangle English, but <laughs> the only one that I'm conversant in. <laughs> but really, I mean, really, playing with you know word word play is it's it's the perfect description for it. I love puns, and despite what some people think, I think it's a very high art, <laughs> especially if a, if you don't just take the lowest hanging pun, you develop into something much more elegant um mm -hmm. you, you know one of the things that jeff was saying with the the stories and talking to kids was with objects um whenever i'm at a restaurant with someone and and uh and we're trying to figure something out we always take out the sugar packets and the you know uh, salt and pepper shaker and we'll move them all around and we'll go, this is going to be this and this is that and and then you're going to say this and then this person's over here and name them all and have the whole ecosystem, you know, laid out there on the table with all the, you know, utensils and stuff. And that usually brings people into the, into it, like Jeff's uh, talking about with those kids, because it's suddenly they're above it and they're a director now. They're not, it's, they're just mo moving the things around. So yeah. it, it's, it, it do, do you clean it up afterwards or do you no. let <laughs> <laughs> Take a picture of it and leave. Okay. <laughs> And, and what, we had a comment, uh, it, and one of the persons says, I, I do, it's amazing to compare languages if you start thinking about different words and different translations. I was working on a project today for a, an article that I'm doing about for a local a public uh, utility district who is having a fundraiser to auction off, a, a, a raffle off a Christmas tree to raise money to donate to people who have trouble paying their bill during the winter time when it's so cold and the heating bill goes up. And I discovered that the uh, O. Tannenbaum, the German, uh, was originally a Silesian carol that a fellow in 1824 redid and made the O. Tannenbaum song out of. And there are at least a dozen different English translations of it, each of which take one aspect of it and twists it very slightly. So it is amazing sometimes to see when you translate from language and back. Wow. So um, where, where do you see this going? And, and I'm just thinking that son of Think Like a Cartoonist has to be in the planning stages at the moment. The, 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 <laughs> the which son of? Son of Think Like a Cartoonist, yeah. Or the return of the valley of the son of, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, there were a lot of stories that didn't make it into the first book. And I'm sure, I mean, I would think it would be a whole lot of fun to do a series like this, mm -hmm. maybe even yearly, but I think I need an assistant because it was a lot of work. I'm not complaining, but it did take four years. Yeah. So I just want to, you know. I've only got so many years, you know, I, how many can I put out? <laughs> yeah. Got to get started. <laughs> it's not about, about this. Um, speaking of creativity, was there ever something you tried that did work out, but it spurred you to do something different that did work out? Uh, yeah, many, many, many times. Uh, you cannot see the stack that's probably more than a foot tall of rejects in my three-tier shelf over there. But occasionally I will go through those and and I'll find, hey, that's that's pretty close to I, I was so close, but it, it didn't click. And even just yesterday, I was playing around uh typical of the season. I, I was doing some rough sketches with a gingerbread man at the beach, facing facing the ocean, just seeing from the back, and I wanted to do something philosophical with him. And I could not come up with anything <laughs> worthy, but two other gingerbread cartoons were developed from that that do work which i'm not going to tell you what they are you just have to wait till see where they're published but one will be on uh december 31st of this year because you know that's the next sunday deadline okay <laughs> are there i've got a question for you are there um like the gingerbread man is hilarious yeah I, I, you know the and pinocchio and there's several what what are some of your very favorite uh revisiting type of uh you know subject matter that you you know just gotta they're timeless and you've got to go back to well pretty anything with animals yeah. well like the chicken and the egg you use in the book right. is right. really good 
<laughs> chicken and egg or cow jumping over the moon or yeah, how many ways a... can a cow jump over the moon or or how many ways can a chicken cross the road or you know the which came first kind of a the thing i love playing off things that people know you want to stay you you don't want to go too far off the off the path because then you're going to lose the audience you, you know you do something that's somewhat familiar so people can grasp onto it uh, i mean i'm not going to do abstract art cartoons unless there's a joke within or like, something with picasso that people would know because that's a very recognizable name um it makes your stuff timeless classic yeah, yeah. Uh, that's 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 one of the rules if, if it was drawn 30 years ago it should be relevant today and 30 years from now mm -hmm. i don't know where i'll be 30 years from now but at least the cartoon will still be relevant <laughs> yeah speaking of of, of uh, cartoons that i find really excellent i'm a big fan of his grim reaper cartoons oh yeah, yeah i i really think i keep suggesting that that's a collection that maybe there aren't enough of just that but a, a, a supernatural which would, he does cartoons on witches and ghosts and whatnot. I think that would be a, a big sell because one of his previous best books was uh, had had to do with uh, oh, just popped out of my head the uh, 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 ah, Lee, help me out here the 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 pop culture uh, one. oh twisted pop culture twisted well, pop well, culture yeah yeah well everything is pop everything becomes pop culture as soon as there's a a song a movie a radio you know it's just anything a tv strip mm -hmm. i mean any everything becomes pop culture and i like to think I mean, pop culture joins generations together um you know i and I'm, my earliest influence would have been warner brothers cartoons oh. i would watch saturday morning or mgm you know tom and jerry but you know but within those cartoons they read they were referencing movie stars well yeah. before i was around because those cartoons ran originally in movie theaters and so they were in the maybe what late 30s 40s 50s and i was watching them in the early 60s and, and on but they were you know like i say there were all these movie stars that were probably under contract to warner brothers so they could use their likeness in the in the cartoons but they would make you know you know reference to different songs or movies or movie stars or whatever they were so they are joining generations together uh which uh, to me is just really really interesting because that um if you listen to the early uh soundtracks for those cartoons those are incredible and they're written by you know real composers and some of them are referencing back to way before those cartoons uh were born i go like blue danube is is one of the cartoons you'd hear in like a warner brothers cartoon yeah. lots of other ones but uh yeah. that it's it's terrific how that they all came together all those pieces came together and they were just in seven minute shorts so <laughs> yeah. i say uh you know cartoons are highly educational okay how many of us? How many of us uh, learned our opera from Bugs Bunny? Valkyrie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> the 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 uh, Figaro. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the barber chair barber, that kept going. Barber, yeah, when he's yeah. like, barber Seville. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I I just have uh, uh, Paul uh, Lee's brother has has a question. He says, "I'm watching." Very trouble, Lee. <laughs> uh, Lee, do you still have the giant cartoon? Uh, not with me no a mom and dad must have thrown it out uh, but i can recreate it if you want okay this is obviously a family thing we won't want to well that's that it's the giant the kindergarten giant where the head was too big oh oh that that okay uh, sure absolutely well i just wanted to, to pop in another one here if i can do this without being too disrespectful let's this is one of my all-time favorites <laughs> oh that's sad yeah <laughs> it is it is sick sick lee that's yeah. sick I, I think one of the things i have noticed about his work is he gets the most amazing expressions on animals faces that convey that and i don't know where that came from but do you do you study animals is that is that what uh what um, gave that inspiration i have the uh the book uh, called how to draw animals that was published in 1950 that was my mom's and it's on that 
bookshelf behind me, that very messy bookshelf behind me. Uh, and that is, they show, there's some funny cartoony stuff in there, but really it's a really realistic, anatomically correct drawing. And, and just, which my characters are never anatomically correct. I don't think they could exist in any real sense of the word. Uh, so they didn't teach me expressions, but I think that is the most, maybe the most important part of a cartoon is getting the expressions just right. Not just talking heads where it's, you know, you, I don't, you have to get the feel of it. You have to put as much emotion into those, into those expressions as possible uh, to squeeze out because you don't have animation to rely on. You're drawing a still cartoon or a non-animated cartoon. You know, one of the things that strikes me with your expressions on your characters are their expressions we have seen on human faces, and um, and you you change it to be on a on a cow or on a cat or something. Yeah. Um, but but we recognize that expression in our you know our parents or our kids or whoever. Um, sure. Somehow you actually capture that. Are you inspired by some of the? the uh the people around you uh when you're creating that do you think oh that's going to be my brother or that's going to be jeff or whatever do you think I, that I, I plead the fifth on this <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay what i thought yes i would say every <laughs> everything you see influences you in some way every you draw from all your life's experiences and what you read uh, what you hear what you see so yeah we have a question joy hall asks lee what is the best part of being a cartoonist napping when i want to <laughs> <laughs> and, and follow closely i playing you know fetch with the dog throwing the ball when i want to yeah uh but but really the freedom to be able to express pretty much anything i want to express within uh, within certain guidelines of course uh, because it's primarily public newspapers and the like mm -hmm. but it's it's really that freedom of you know, with great freedom comes great responsibility and all that. But it's mm -hmm. it's just a lot of fun to be. Here's here's a blank piece of paper. Do whatever you want with it, as long as it's funny and doesn't offend too many people. Okay, I want to ask about that, Lee, because it, we're you know you mangle the Boy Scout tenants or whatever. I love that. I I just love that, and you talk about. Um, the elements of creativity and you include irreverence. And this is, you know, the one that I relate to so uh, strongly. Um, what? How do you, that fine line between irreverence and being insulting? Because I do think that a lot of comics, um, comedians cross that line and it's not funny to me. If you're being mean, if you're being insulting, it's not funny to me. But you you know just where you know how far you can push it without going too far. How do you think that's something you had to learn? Do you just naturally have a feel for that? I think it's just a developed um, skill. Uh, although you're bound to offend somebody, yeah, <laughs> sometime you know without without trying, it it just will happen. Uh, but no, the, the yeah, my I don't do editorial cartoons for a reason. Uh, mm -hmm. well, for one, it's horrifying, and you have to stay right up on, on the latest. I'd rather do very broad, uh, you know, timeless humor, uh, and it is not meant to offend people. It's to either make them laugh, maybe with a, make people think a little bit, or you know, to get the joke or you know, connect some dots, which is kind of this whole connecting of interesting, weird little disparate dots to, to create something new. Uh, yeah, so my goal is not, so that's one of the goals. I don't want to uh, upset too many people on purpose. There are I, days I, where I would like to, <laughs> that's, but they stay out of the, of the job, you know. Yeah. I have to, Rick Rittenberg just checked in and said, how do the students at RIT respond to your cartoons? Good to see you, Rick. Hi, Rick, who, whose name made it into the uh, element of surprise cartoon there. Yeah. And was the, and I'll repeat again, was the guinea pig for this. Uh, <laughs> I, the students are absolutely wonderful. 
at RIT. Um, they, the when, especially in person, it's terrific because you get real live feedback. And I'm, you know, clearly not of the same generation anymore. So I want to be able to relate as much as possible to as many students as possible. And certain of the pop culture references that I'm drawing on may not resonate. So I try to really make it work with them. And uh, and I've worked with, I don't know, hundreds of students over the last five years. It's been terrific. I mean, seriously, seriously bright uh, people. Uh, I'm impressed. What can I say? <laughs> oh, all right. I, I have this really off the wall question, which is so perfect for you. Uh, it says, where do the goon drawings come from? And do bats have anything to do with goons? Gee, I wonder if Mike wrote this cartoon. <laughs> or wrote this letter. Mike is a, a author of one of my oldest friends as well from the same elementary school as Rick. Uh, and we used to do this game where we'd have bats versus goons. Um, <laughs> I, where, I, where we should have really been studying, you know. Uh, so go the goon character was a little early character that my dad showed me how to draw. And it ended up, my version of it ended up in my signature every day. That little, little two eyes and a, a nose thing. The bats are your thing, Mike. Because, oh, I know, because of M, you would change your M into the into a into a bat is that right i'll say it's right okay so you can correct me later um, okay yeah I, i'm gonna i'm gonna do this because i think it would be uh amusing since you mentioned uh, about that so do this right on up at the corner here you oh, can there. see his little goon figure oh, yeah. as it is and it's and this again one of my great cartoons Again, thinking not outside the box, below the surface as well. Well, this, this was inspired by uh, my wife and I were at Pismo Beach, and we kept seeing this whale jump out of the water. It just it was incredible, like over and over and over again, and way closer to the shore. So it must really drop off. Uh, yeah. And I was just like, God, what is going on there? And it, you know, then it's like, well, what you see, and then what you don't see. You know, it was that it was very inspirational. Yeah. That's one of those where I can spot it exactly. You're like, yeah, that's where I got the idea from. Yeah. And I, I want to note the expression on the fish below. That's an example of his startlement expression. Again, yeah. very well done. So much fun is part of your life that uh, I have to tell a quick story where, where my connection when we comes in, I was working at the Dallas Chronicle and I was the news editor. And one day in 2008, this guy with this curly hair and the big smile comes in and he's selling us a cartoon. And in the 21 years I worked for Eagle Newspapers, it was the only new cartoon we ever picked up. And it was a opening chance to become a good friend uh, and uh, enjoy a lot of humor. And I really thank him for that. Well. Thanks, Roger. Uh, by the way, Roger is an awesome trivia guy at Trivia Night at that place in the Dallas. Um, I would like to go back there and do that again because yeah. everybody's on his team always wins and we don't have to work very hard. So. <laughs> well, I, I will tell you that there was a bar in, in the Dallas and they used to do trivia nights where you everybody put five bucks in the pot and the team that won split it and uh, we and two of his close friends, including Rick, was there, and we killed him. I think we split 65 bucks that night, so rock on. But we donated it back. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the book, because we're getting kind of close to the time to, to wind it up. And I understand yes, that uh, that book right there, Think Like a Cartoonist, there we go. And it is a, a wonderful book, and the contributors did a wonderful job. And my understanding is that there's going to be a special deal offered to people who signed up for this. Is that correct? That, that's what I hear. Yeah, I think they're going <laughs> to... That's what I've, that's I, what I've been told. I, I think that, that uh, RIT is going to send out a, uh, a code you can use to get a discount for anybody that's watching. Here's, here's Marmy. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Marnie yeah. Stone from RIT Press here. Yeah. Um, when you first registered for the webinar, you did get a coupon code in your email. So go back and um, check your email from a, a same place you found the uh, link to join the webinar today. You'll have a coupon. Um, I also pa pasted the um, code into the question and answer box below. Um, so you can go right to the website press.rat.edu and use coupon code 15 Ruben to get 15% off the book. Yeah. Uh, um, we're also going to be giving away two copies of the book tonight to uh, two random attendees. So I'm going to be drawing those names in just a minute and I will send to Roger to announce momentarily. Awesome. Thank you. All righty. This is fantastic. And uh, I just want to say, I really appreciate the people with their questions. Some of those have been absolutely fascinating and really helped as a, you know, those of us who moderate things love to have questions from the audience because a lot of them are people who, all these extra minds coming together really help things. Uh, some final thoughts from each of the panelists? Yeah. Me? Yeah. Yes. Well, I just like to say something to all those budding cartoonists out there. You should pursue that as an occupation if you possibly can, because you're doing good for the world. Your cartoon makes people smile. It just might mean the person that sees that cartoon won't beat on their spouse that day. They won't yell at the kids. They won't get involved with road rage or something like that, just because you brought a smile to their face. Don't discount the effect you can create by having being a cartoonist and sharing your humor to the world. It's something worth pursuing. Here, here. Yes. Absolutely. Hey. Okay. Yep. Uh, Deb, final thoughts? Well, this makes a wonderful Christmas gift. Uh, look, this is not just a skinny little book. This is a substantial book, um, but you can pick it up and read um, a story and you got these wonderful cartoons and you don't have to commit the entire day to it. You can pick it up and you can be inspired and laugh and meet some just incredible people. And it's it's not just another joke book. This has substance. And again, I'm very, very proud to be part of it and so grateful that, um, that Lee asked me because this one's going to stand the test of time. And I, I foresee many reprints because this is going to keep, um, it, it's going to keep being on the shelves and under the Christmas trees and, um, you know, Hanukkah is coming too, you know, so it's, um, it, it really is a lovely gift. So you yes. give it eight times, give one at every night. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. and don't forget Festivus for the rest of us. So yeah, that's here right. We here we go. Robin, some thoughts. Oh, I just think the book is so much fun. And of course, Lee is so much fun. And there's, you know, one of the things that I really enjoy is Lee's calendar. <laughs> no, you're, oh, yes. I also, also love the cartoon a day. You know, so uh, there's so many fun things to to find uh, if you if you're just if you've not met Lee or haven't had the opportunity to know much about his stuff. This book's a great way to get into it. All right. Well, um, if we can come up with those names, we will announce the winners of a couple of books here. Um, they're they're right in the chat there, Roger. Oh, okay. Marty, Marty typed them to you in the the chat window. Oh, okay. I was looking in the Q and A instead of the, the chat. So let's see. Winners are. Oh, I'm going to mess this up for sure. Robert Flieger and Wendy Way. And says, I will mail the winners directly for their mailing addresses and send them a copy. So congratulations. Congrats. Hey. All right. <laughs> and I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight and particularly Lee for his creativity and sharing it with everybody. And I do understand this will be recorded and we will get a link to be able to share this with folks that couldn't be here tonight. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, RIT. Thanks, all of you, all the panelists, all the people who contributed and in the immortal words of Bill and Ted, be excellent to each other. Thank Thanks you, so everyone. Good, Good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody.